Not yet. Evaluation. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> this is the Ingenious Panel on Measurement and Evaluation. It's our third of six panels uh, and part of a larger effort to prepare mathematics and statistics professionals. Um, to learn more, you can visit ingeniousmathstat.org. Uh, and I'll hand it off at this point to Peter Turner to get us started. Um, Peter, I think you're muted, sorry. Probably my fault. Still muted on the on the Android. Okay, try again. There we go. Better? Yes. <laughs> Okay. Uh, thank you. I don't know what had happened there, but it, it had done anyway. So, this is Peter Turner. I'm one of the co-leads for the measurement and evaluation uh, panel for the theme for the Ingenious Project. Uh, with me on the panel today is the other co-lead, Bill Trocham from Cornell. And uh, also on the panel is David Wick from, uh, from RIT. Um, those of you that have looked on the ingenious web page will have seen the initial two questions which I posted and then uh, when uh, Bill and I were talking we he put me straight in terms of I thought that I was asking the sort of first questions and he said no they're not first so we're going to rehearse we're going to repeat that conversation try and set the scene today uh, and to give people a, f a feel for how that um, how the discussion might go in terms of where we're headed with the measurement and evaluation aspect of this overall project. So what I had originally as my uh, two two questions: uh, first of all, what measurements should we, uh, what data should we be trying to collect? Um, and how will we determine from those success or failure of any of the initiatives? And the other question was based on uh, the premise that there are a lot of local studies of success of mathematical educational initiatives, and I would say more broadly STEM educational initiatives, um, which reflect retention, persistence, level of preparation and so on um, and one of the key questions I think for the whole project to be useful is going to be how those how the information from those can be combined usefully into a bigger picture uh, representing perhaps a national or at least given just a set of results and so those were my thought my thoughts as a starting point and Bill you had uh, sort of questions that you feel and I agree with you should come before that Bill, it sounds like you're muted, so. Okay, you've just answered my question. <laughs> it's the small gray icon on the top right corner. Still not here.
Hello. Ah, now I, I can hear. I can hear Bill. You can. I can. I don't know what I just did differently. <laughs> well, I, I don't know what what happened either because my my Android got dropped off and then so I re then had to rejoin. So. Oh, okay. Well, there's something happening. All right, so. Can so if you can hear me now, I'm assuming everybody can hear me on this call. Is that right? I I believe can hear, so. Can we hear from anybody else? I can hear you, Bill. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. So Peter asked a question, which a lot of people ask when they start uh, doing evaluation, and that is, what are we going to measure? <laughs> and uh, and my my initial reaction to that as an evaluator is that's like putting the cart before the horse uh, because as an evaluator what I need to know before I can answer the question of what are we going to measure is what are we trying to do what are we trying to accomplish with evaluation what are what are what is uh, the program that we're looking at trying to accomplish who are the key stakeholders and how do these uh, stakeholders uh, look at the evaluation that's being done what do they want out of it uh, certainly would be some of the questions that I put before I would ever get to uh, asking about what should we be measuring um, I want to know what are the key uh, evaluation questions uh, I want to know and, and in order for me to determine that I'd like to have some sense of how are the key people involved in the program thinking about the program that is what do they think they are doing in what constitutes the program and what kinds of outcomes or effects do they think they're having so in a causal sense looking at the cause effect relationships but in a modeling sense we're really looking at what we traditionally would call a logic model of some sort a uh, uh, a listing of the activities and then the short medium and long-term outcomes so these are some of the uh, questions that I'd have uh, of, uh, before I'd get to measurement what is you know who, who, who are the stakeholders what are we trying to do with the program what do we want to answer with the evaluation how do we think the program operates uh, and once we have those things uh, uh, laid out then I think we have some idea of what the program is, what its boundaries are, what the outcomes are, and we can begin to prioritize operationalizing, and that's really where the measurement stuff's going to come in. Does that make any sense, Peter? Yes, it does, and I, I think um, you know, I think I think it, it's absolutely important to figure out what it is. Essentially, what are we trying to achieve, and 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 as you say, who are the stakeholders, and then to to figure out the other questions from there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I think this would be a good opportunity maybe to bring Dave into the discussion a little bit because in a sense he represents one of the customer stakeholders. Mm -hmm. um, although we're primarily looking at the math and statistics workforce, uh, most people that are trained as mathematicians and statisticians in their undergraduate careers will end up using mathematics and statistics within some other context rather than necessarily being, for example, academic mathematicians or statisticians. Mm -hmm. And so Dave, who has good experience as kind of a customer and a very closely related one in the sense of being a physicist uh, and having interest in uh, diver bringing diverse populations into the STEM fields as a whole, I think would probably have some interesting in insights in terms of some of the things that we're trying to achieve and and some of the stakeholders that you mentioned, Bill. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sure, I I can make a couple comments. Uh, I think if you look at the kind of the the, the bigger picture. Uh, I, I've often talked to my students about just the, the, the STEM labor force and uh, considering that, that if you look at the STEM labor force, it really constitutes or it's, it's comprised of about 5% of the, of the entire labor force in the country uh, is made up of, of STEM professionals. And uh, if you look over, and I think I wrote down 
some information about this. If you look over uh, a 50 year period, that 5% has been responsible for about 50% of the uh, nation's economic expansion. Uh, and that's a pretty phenomenal statistic when you start thinking about that. Uh, a very small group responsible for 50% uh, of, of, of the country's economic expansion. Uh, I think that it, it speaks to the, the need for, uh, for us to protect and grow the, the STEM population, it, it's, it certainly is a broad consensus that we need to uh, expand the pipeline, expand the quality of, of the students that are coming through that pipeline, uh, the, the STEM pipeline. If you think about the, the, the pipeline itself, you really have components, the K-12 component, it's a long pipeline. You have the K-12 component, you have that leading into the undergraduate piece, and then that leading into uh, graduate curriculum or, or even industry. In terms of stakeholders, probably at the end of that pipeline, uh, you, you have uh, the biggest stakeholders would be industrial professionals and, and what they're looking to, uh, to get out of uh, students who come through that pipeline. Um, those, I, I have a, a, a number of uh, colleagues who, who are now working in industry and often return to the university and ask questions, you know, often return to the university to do recruitment. And I'll ask them, well, what are you looking for in a, in a STEM professional? What is it that, that uh, you, you hope to find? You know, most of them are not looking for somebody who is, uh, how should I say, in, in, entirely versed in a particular area of content. I mean, certainly at the undergraduate level, I'm talking about undergraduates here, uh, at, at the undergraduate level, uh, in in science and engineering, you have your your typical tracks, uh, different types of engineering, etc. But at the end of the day, most people are looking for somebody who's who's competent, who who is capable of analytical thinking. Uh, I think that that's a that's a tough thing to measure. Uh, I I would I would suspect it's easier to measure content. Uh, I would imagine than it would be to actually measure uh, one's analytical ability. But at the end of the day, I think that that's what the professionals are looking for. Bill, you looked as if you were, were about to respond to that. No, no. I mean, I, I, first of all, I, I, think there, I think I, I don't know off the top of my head, but I think there probably are some pretty interesting tests of analytical ability that we could look at if if that's a measure that uh, if that's an outcome that's important and it does sound from the comments like it is I guess what, what I was trying to say uh, is that before we get to diving into specific measures uh, I'd like to know about, about a program uh, you know what what is it trying to do uh, is there agreement in what we're trying to do? So, so you just made a nice, eloquent case about the importance of analytic methods uh, and analytic ability, and I'm sure that's not the only thing that people would be looking for. They might be looking, for instance, at uh, whether uh, people know how to get along with one another. If we're going to develop a team science kind of approach, and you're going to have to be able to collaborate in, in your scientific work when you're a professional. Uh, and so that might be another outcome. And I think that what, what happens is that different stakeholders to the, to the programs, including the people who are delivering the program, uh, different stakeholders come with different interests and with different kinds of a sense of what the program is trying to do. And very often, uh, the, when you begin to get into uh, laying out a model of what it is you're trying to do, uh, we discover that there's a lot less consensus about what people were trying to do in a program than they might have been at the outset. Uh, so I guess the, the, for me the prior uh, question to the question about measurement in evaluation is uh, is the question of coming up with a conceptual framework, a conceptual model that can help to guide our choices about measures. And I think what you just articulated very well is one particular measure or measurement area that we will want to include in that model and 
So we've already begun, in a sense, the modeling task uh, by, by having this kind of a discussion. But we want to do more of that in order to understand the nature of, the, of what we're doing in our program and the nature of what we're going to be trying to get at for outcomes. Does that, I don't know if that makes any sense to you. Yeah, I, I think that makes a lot of sense, Bill. I, yeah, absolutely, and I, I think... Go ahead. Go ahead, Dave. No, I, I, I was just going to agree that I that certainly makes a lot of sense. I'm not uh, intimately familiar with the nature of this particular program to to know what you know what that framework is going to look like. Um, I, I don't know, Peter, if you have any insights into that. Well, I, I was going to comment a little bit on that because I think what Bill's comments and your comments uh, really point to an enormous breadth, which will probably mean that there are a huge number of things that we want to try and measure, try and assess, because at some level we're talking about curricular type changes in the K-12 undergraduate and subsequent uh, levels of STEM education. In some measure we're talking about developing the problem-solving analytical sorts of skills that you you were talking about, Dave. In some cases, in some senses, we're talking about where where the people are going to be both coming from and going to in terms of uh, backgrounds and the careers that they're heading into. And I think that I, I think that probably we're going to have to really. Uh, start with, in fact, an enormously broad range of different things that we're going to be looking at because the range of stakeholders is very broad in this case and I think that the objectives that those stakeholders have, if we're talking about regular changes and retention of students through the critical transitions in the early years of college, the sorts of things we'd be looking at and measuring there are going to be very different from the sorts of things that reflect on the career success that Dave was pointing to. And we've got to address all of those things. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I think that you know the whole assessment package is probably going to be uh, fairly complex and fairly broad. Yeah, we're, we're the, uh, Peter. Correct me if I'm wrong. We are looking at everything from K through 12, right? K through at least 16. I, we're certainly looking at least in the undergraduate. Of, of course, of course. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I think that if you're looking at the ultimate career paths and so on. Um, we actually have to say we're also looking, we, we would certainly want to be interested in how that carries on into at least professional level graduate programs and, and maybe into PhD type programs as well. Okay. Yeah. So really cutting across, and, and so, so we're looking at programs that cut across a broad range of, of territory and outcomes yep. that, go, that can go on for the careers of these of the people who are in the programs of the young people who are in the programs yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so so I guess for you as an experienced evaluator bill this is just a you know <laughs> your bread and butter right well it <laughs> certainly gives us something to do <clears throat> keeps us off the streets uh, uh, I, I guess that you know I would make a distinction between I guess what I would call the, the local and the global from a systems point of view where you have lots of local mm -hmm. programs uh, that, that we're trying to implement. And then we also uh, are looking at the set of programs as a system. And uh, in the last 10 years or so in evaluation, there's been an enormous move in the direction of what I call systems evaluation, what many of us would call systems evaluation. And it really has to do with this problem that you're talking about, the idea that how do we evaluate not just this particular educational intervention, but how do we make sense then of the portfolio of, of educational interventions? And how do you even begin to organize that? And I think that that's a, a, a huge challenge for evaluation, just as it is for the management of these kinds of things. So, so again, for me, 
a key to a lot of this stuff is uh, is epitomized in the I think it was Aristotle who said or Socrates who said well begun is half done and I think there's some truth to that and well begun here uh, is very likely to involve uh, trying to find out what do people think they're doing <laughs> with this stuff what do we what is our what is our implicit model what's our implicit hypotheses and if you have multiple programs like this, then the challenge becomes, how do we take the model from this local program and that local program and another local program and harmonize those models and start looking at where are the common outcomes in those models that we might be able to actually think about aggregating across if we're thinking about looking across a portfolio. Um, where are the sequences? How do these models sequence with each other? You've, you're talking about sequencing both the programs and then a whole sequence or pathway of potential outcomes that might occur and that these programs might intersect with in different ways. So I think that, that we have a, a huge conceptual challenge uh, which is not unrelated to uh, why are we doing this stuff in the first place? Uh, the, the, this conceptual ch challenge is not just an evaluative one, it's also a management one. Uh, it's a challenge that says, you know, we, we've made choices to do this collection of programs and we've made choices about each of these programs. And so what do we think we're doing here? So when we model these program, uh, the, the program's intense. Uh, when we involve the key stakeholders and ask them about this, uh, 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 we're also not just doing an evaluative task, we're really doing a planning task. We're doing a strategic thinking task uh, and we're doing a management task. And I think it's really important to understand the integral, integral relationships uh, among evaluation and those other things. A lot of people tend to think of evaluation as something we do after the fact and as a separate thing from everything else that we're doing. But for, as an evaluator, I can tell you, I don't know what to do to evaluate a program until I have some sense from the people who are doing the program about what it is they want to do. So that, and, and, and you've got, in this context that we're talking about, Peter, you've got this hierarchy of multiple levels of programs, multiple points in time that I think makes this an even more complex task. Uh, but the, the only way to get at this, in, 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 I think, in a rational way uh, for evaluation purposes is to begin with uh, trying to articulate even the simplest versions of models for these kinds of things. So I'm really sort of dodging the evaluation measurement question here, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> well, I... I I don't know whether you're dodging it, such as making it plain that there's a certain there's a fair amount of thought that needs to go into it first. Uh, and you know, I've often said to students when in tests and other uh, other settings that it's perfectly okay to think before you start answering the question. And uh, and I think essentially you're giving us that advice and, and saying, okay, well, let's think about what it is that we're really trying to get to here and how all the pieces fit together. Then we can start talking about how we how we actually measure whether we're, whether we're achieving what we want. Right. Um, and okay. and it, it occurs to me that in all of that breadth of stuff that we talked about, we didn't even mention the other themes of the Ingenious Project, which certainly come into this, the MOOCs and the use of technology. We didn't mention um, the the internships and the job place mm -hmm. pieces. And all of those have in which this is measurement and evaluation of the Ingenious Project certainly the measurement and evaluation of those other theme areas has to be a piece of it too and, and yeah. that wasn't even in our litany. Yeah. Peter, I, I, so I think the, the real thing here is that it's great to have somebody like, like Bill on board who's, uh, who's going to be able to, to uh, guide us through this, this uh, rather murky area. Peter, I, I lost you there for a, a, a little bit. I, I didn't quite hear everything that you said, uh, but I, I 
I did have a question for Bill based on something, uh, his prior comments, just regarding, I, I, I was originally talking about stakeholders kind of at the end of the pipeline, and Bill, I think you're referring to uh, stakeholders being uh, the, the, the groups actually running the programs in some sense, our, our, our stakeholders here, and how, I'm interested in that systems approach that you were talking about and how you actually, how do you actually go about connecting yeah. the dots there yeah. uh, across so many multiple programs that have so many, uh, I, mean, I mean certainly there are commonalities but they, the, the focus can be very different from one program to another in terms of uh, not just the goal but in terms of demographics and, uh, and such. Yeah, yeah. No, I think those are those are great questions. Well, how do we how do we go about doing this? Is uh, is uh, is a good question, and I think one of the things that that I would well, first of all, on the stakeholder question, uh, let me come back to that. Um, you're right; there are very many different types of stakeholders some of whom are more proximal to the program in terms of its delivery, some of whom are more proximal or more distal from the program and who are who are uh, 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 further down the pipeline or the pathway or however we want to describe it. Um, and the way in which I think we try to deal with this kind of complexity, uh, if we recognize that, that at the very beginning, it's a thinking problem, it's a thinking challenge. How, how are we going to conceptualize what it is we're trying to do here so that we can even get our arms around evaluation? You've got to have some kind of an approach. You've got to have some kind of a methodology. And I think we've developed a number of those in evaluation. So within a specific program, one of the ways in which we try to uh, uh, to model the program is through what we call a logic model or a theory of change. And, uh, and there are steps that one can follow to articulate that logic model. Uh, uh, at, at, the, at the global level, you're going to have then a problem of having lots of disparate programs with disparate models and it would be really useful if they were expressed in some kind of common form so that you can actually begin to think about synthesizing what this program looks like uh, as a uh, as a as a broader global initiative so we need a methodology for articulating what it is that we're thinking about uh, and one that then sets us up for being able to plan evaluations well um, and you know, I, I've spent the last five years of my uh, career uh, working on an NSF grant where we've been developing what we call a systems evaluation protocol. And that is nothing more than a, se a series of steps that any group can follow in, in order to articulate uh, and develop an evaluation plan for a program. And step number one is who's got a stake in this program? So it really start going back to what you were just talking about. We, we actually draw a, a little map of, uh, it looks sort of like a target, uh, your program's in the center. We actually then start naming who are the people who have a stake in this program and put them close or further away from that program center. So the people who deliver the program have a clear local stake and the taxpayers in the United States, citizens of the United States have very remote stakes and you've got everything else in between. The various delivery mechanisms, the families of the kids who are going through these programs, you've got uh, the funding agencies, you've got all, you know, all sorts of employers uh, who, are, who are waiting down the pipeline and so on. So, so we do this as step one. Uh, of uh, of a uh, of a system evaluation uh, approach to developing a model, um, and and there are there is a series of like fifteen steps just to develop the model, and then you move into once you have an articulated model and it's actually a visual picture, it's like a causal pathway diagram of what you think. Uh, what's what's being done on one side, and then what are the short, medium, and long-term outcomes uh, uh, on the other end? And basically, uh, it's a directed graph. And uh, once you have that, then we look at those kinds of models, and we can start to see where are the outcomes that are most immediate. 
where are the outcomes through which most of the arrows travel? Uh, where they're sort of the grand, uh, uh, grand central station uh, nodes in this model. Because those are outcomes we're almost certainly the more proximal they are to the program and the, and the more nodes they've got going th uh, through them, the more important that uh, outcome is going to be for us to focus on. Because we're going to have to make choices in evaluation uh, about, um, about resources and about what we're going to look at. And there's going to be different stakeholders who want to look at different things. And we're going to need a rationale for making those kinds of choices. So, th so th there, there are steps for doing this kind of stuff. You know, this is just one way of doing it. But I, if I can, yeah. go ahead, Peter. I can just step in a little bit there, and in one sense, maybe simplify the the situation slightly, because although um, we've been talking about the broad spectrum from uh, K twelve and then on into not just the undergraduate but also the graduate realm. Um, the particular target of the ingenious program and the ingenious project is aimed primarily at the undergraduate realm and and going on into the graduate realm. Um, K-12 only peripherally to the extent of the obviously the, where the pipeline that they've talked about kind of starts, but we're really interested in the flow uh, once they're already at the at the college entry type level or, or beyond so that that would reduce at least a little bit the complexity of that model um, so that that might uh, might help us a, a little bit there uh, I also we uh, Paul Zorn uh, Paul Zorn who's the director of the overall program has uh, emailed in a, a comment which actually relates back to something that Dave said early on um, and asks a specific question and I don't know whether Bill you have any uh, insight on this I I don't particularly um, but he's he talking about the fact that he would be interested in tests that aim to assess higher level abilities like critical thinking and problem solving analytic ability and so on much as Dave was talking about earlier for for the subsequent career uh, capabilities and he mentions the collegiate learning assessment as being something that is fairly general in that sort of realm but I'm wondering whether there is anything that one might call a stem CLA or or if there isn't is a reasonable goal of what this team might be looking at conceivably the development of something like that yeah I, I don't know if there is a a particular stem collegiate learning assessment approach uh, so I can't I can't speak to that uh, generally but um, but it certainly seems to me that I mean, you know, maybe 